Yeah, so anyway, we can't do that anymore because they've been declared an endangered species. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we're live now. All right. And uh, sorry for no countdown or anything, everyone, but uh, hello, uh, heroes and villains. Welcome to another episode of Initiative, uh, whether it be your first or, you know, you've been here for a while. Thank you for coming. We are joined here by a very special guest that hopefully you can see <laughs> if, if the tech has allowed it. Yeah. Hopefully everything's working. <laughs> oh, man. The Twitch gods. Uh, yeah. uh, it's going to be real awkward if just you four talking to yourself. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Like We're used to that. I guess that's like tabletop in general. Just yeah. Hey, no, that's, that looks pretty good to All me. right. Sounds good. All yeah. right. Uh, Crystal Frazier. Hello. Hi. Hello. <laughs> uh, if you would, in a couple sentences, or just tell us what you do over at Green Ronin and everything, just a, a very basic, you know, uh, about me section here. Uh, well, I'm the line developer for Mutants and Masterminds, which basically means, like, Steve Kenson created the system years and years ago. He's still really closely involved in the line, but mm. all of the day in day out work of deciding what we're going to publish hiring writers writing art orders putting books together editing is is all on my plate so yeah. i all the super yeah. busy work of, <laughs> of the technicalities yeah, of everything yeah. Yeah. Steve, steve did all the glamorous stuff and now i'm like, <laughs> putting out adventures every month <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you very much for coming on the show. Mm -hmm. uh, we're all very uh, grateful for it yeah. and mm -hmm. for a chance for uh, Green Ronin to send somebody on over. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Happy to come on. And I am, again, so very sorry. I just worked through my alarm last week. That's fine. That's <laughs> it happens. Don't right. even you know, worry about it. We all it. have you know, our, our sleeping stories and everything. You know? <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> so uh, basically the way the this whole interview is discussions in a go is uh, we just have some questions prepared and uh for an hour hour and a half give or take we're just going to ask you about your work um within tabletop uh community and and that space in itself along with the green Ronin company and we're going to go from there uh if that's okay so yeah sounds great all right uh chat uh be sure to remind us or to, you know, let us know if anything sounds really weird if you're hearing some crappy stuff or yeah, whatever. any audio issues or yeah, video issues anything like that should be fine yeah. uh and uh, if you liked what you see uh this will be on youtube end of this week we're also on spotify uh google music apple podcasts and all the uh, all, those all the social those, media all those those and fucking everything yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> and we'll okay, do so some... this is mostly going to be an audio after after broadcast so i should probably use charts to explain everything yeah exactly. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we will have powerpoint presentations yeah. 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 I, our green screen. I feel yeah. like the charts speak for themselves so i'm just gonna be quiet yeah, yeah. <laughs> perfect <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah i guess we should just Go right into the questions and whatnot, Jump right? Right in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's do it. So, uh, so I know there are two very popular sort of items, and uh, right now I'm going to go into mutants and masterminds in general because we are predominantly a mutants and masterminds uh, show mm. when we play. That's the only oh, game good. we play on here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I'm a little biased, but I think that's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah well, we are too. <laughs> we just did like 30 weeks of it. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So uh, right now, I know the two like most popular, or rather, uh, what I see most advertised on the space are the Danger Zones and the Astonishing uh, Adventure series. Could you perhaps explain a bit to people who don't know what those are, the difference between those two products and, and, and sources there? So our, our Astonishing Adventures is our line of monthly Mutants and Masterminds adventures. So every month, it's a new probably single session adventure i mean it mm. depends on your gm sure and, sure like, yeah how much you love to role play ideally uh, <laughs> they can take, yeah they can take two sessions i've i had a run of reign of cats and dogs originally take three sessions so yeah. uh but it it got trimmed back in development from that mm -hmm. so uh but yeah they're they're designed to be like single session adventures to kind of get your heroes running do a lot of the the groundwork for a gm it's mm -hmm. you know just like dungeons and dragons or mm. pathfinder adventure supplements uh mm -hmm. and then danger zones are are a very location specific monthly product it's you know six to ten pages on mm -hmm. some location you typically have a superhero fight so like the top of a bridge or okay. the bank or 
gosh, what did we release that first? I know one? you. I know you did. Uh, yeah, you did banks, junkyards. I believe was one of them as junkyards, well. Junkyards, right? Yeah. And museums. And uh, uh, that's a good one. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> these are all like. There's not really an adventure in there, but it's a big toolkit for game masters mm. where if you want to put an adventure here or a mm. scene here, here's all the cool <laughs> things that you you should think about mm. or that might be useful. Like if you're going to have a fight in the junkyard, here's how the big electromagnet works. And sure. Yeah. Okay. Here, here's the rules for being stuck in a car crusher because it's not a fight in the junkyard until somebody goes in the car crusher. <laughs> Absolutely. It's 100%. 100%. Yeah. yeah, and then each one has some some generic NPCs that you can use or generic monsters like the the junkyard has a mutant raccoon like a giant <laughs> dire raccoon for you write to... that down write that down <laughs> <laughs> and then every everyone has at least one like named NPC who mm -hmm. could be like your your Perry White or your Jimmy Olsen or your Lois Lane or that yeah. I mean there there's more than just media people involved, sure, sure. but yeah 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 right right but it's like People who can be like side characters and supporting characters in your adventures. When uh, that trickles into one question I had specific, specifically about when like designing or, or thinking about danger zones and whatnot over there. Mm -hmm. Oh, first off, let me ask what. Um, uh, so are, are you part of the central like, creative process of that too? Like actually yeah. creating? Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, I do. I do a chunk of the writing for the series. Yes. Uh, All right. Good. I do all of the editing and development. I, I outline all the books. All right, good, oh, good. Nice. Um, yeah. when, when making these sort of zones, I mean, because uh, Mutants and Masterminds is really, really open when it comes to character creation, mm. as, as you know. <laughs> uh, so, I think I get where you're going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Specifically, especially with, like, spaces. So, I mean, so if you have, like, a traditional Dungeons & Dragons sort of style map, where it's like centered off into squares, like five feet, you know, because that's how the game system works. Where I mean, it's a masterminds, we have, you know, a speedster who can run 4,000 miles an hour. Yeah. Yeah. You know, well, over I, there. I'm like, I want to run to Florida this turn. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, know? Yeah. you know, how how does that, I don't think you want to do that. Now, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> but uh, like, how do you consider that sort of distancing work into that? Is that something that's just sort of like a, Mm, you know, we're just gonna have a baseline of thirty feet, like you know, like the average walking <laughs> speed, and like other people have to handle that, or you know, how does that? Yeah, and, I mean, third edition is built on the D twenty engine, mm. like at its very core. So mm -hmm. we've still got that assumption of like a human can walk thirty feet, and we tend to default to like a sure. five foot grid or scale. Yeah, on our that maps. makes sense. Mm -hmm. If it ain't broke, don't but fix again, it. Yeah, when you've got you know speedsters who can move. 4,000 miles in a turn, <laughs> then they can be on and off the map in a single round. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tactical movement's kind of irrelevant. So it really depends on, mm -hmm. it really depends on your game master and your personal style. Some people mm -hmm. really love having the map just to plan out, mm -hmm. like even if you're not using minis, just like, oh, I'm gonna sure. stand over here next to the, the junction box right. and try and get this guy to swing at me. Yeah, it's uh, those, it's, it's like the one, two, three little circles where you're like, this is event one, this is event two, yeah. like that really works. Yep, and it helps, it can help game masters kind of keep everything organized and it can help players kind of imagine the scene like a good illustration might. So mm. they, you know, if they don't know, if they don't have like an illustration or a map of what the inside of this warehouse is like, then they may as well just be having a fight in the streets or in the mm -hmm. middle of an arena or something like that. Because, I mean, unless they can really put themselves, imagine themselves in that scene, yeah. then they're kind of, a lot of players are a little hesitant to bring what they're thinking to the scene. Mm -hmm. they, That's they a good kind point. Of yeah. Want the, they kind of want to know what the scene is. Yeah, it's like yeah, it's yeah. like stepping into the water, like testing the water, yeah. especially within an open system. Yeah. Like, oh, I yeah. imagine it's it, yeah. if you're making your like in any system, if you're making a character for the first time, you don't know what you can break yet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It yeah, it's the the tyranny of choice. I've heard it described. Tyranny. <laughs> oh, that's a good. If everything is possible. Then mm. what you do kind of feels overwhelming. Yeah, you yeah. kind of have to like narrow it down. Mm -hmm. Like I yeah, catch that's myself why in the beginning of all the time. Seems a lot scarier than you know chocolate or vanilla. Yeah, <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, I like catch myself in the beginning of turns, going, "Okay, what's around me?" Yeah, yeah. 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 So like, I know what I want to do, but like, how can I get to it from here? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, 
So with like a speedster, you kind of have to say, okay, where do you want to be on the map of this turn? Because <laughs> yeah. <laughs> odds are you can get there, yeah. no matter what. Like, just tell me where you want to end your turn, then yeah. narrate how you got there. <laughs> so. Even just like a, a paragon with mm. five or six ranks of flight can just yeah. travel the entire map in less than a turn. So oh, yeah. a lot of it is just there for to help the players and the game master visualize everything mm. and keep it straight. That's a good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't want to take up all the questions, so go ahead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, let's see. On the spot, come on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Rapid fire. <laughs> I got another one if you need to organize your thoughts. Um, what? Uh, what was the first like zone that you were like created like at the start of like the uh, the adventures, the danger zones? So at the start of the process, I wrote up the aquarium as like an example to give to my writers. So mm. like, oh wow, you know, this is what we want you to like. This is what each section contains. Yeah, this okay. Is, like know, a template. Basically, yeah. how we want you yeah. to break it down. Yeah. So uh, I wrote I wrote the aquarium up as a as an example because I volunteered at the aquarium when I was back in high school. Back in. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh -huh. yep. yeah. <laughs> I, I've always loved the idea of like fights in an aquarium or yeah. Yeah. in an aquarium. It just sounds like really that. awesome. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. a lot of potential. I'm yeah. Yeah. Totally. waiting for that. Someone gets thrown through a tank and then yep. like two sharks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the cover of the book is actually a fight in the aquarium. That's <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> awesome. What when but, um yeah, I had an ongoing rivalry with an octopus at one point in my teenage career. <laughs> Don't oh we all? <laughs> <laughs> I know it's cliche. But... <laughs> I was gonna ask where where um, this sort of inspiration for these locations come from. You know, it, it there is you know the 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 junkyard. You know, you've seen heroes fight in a junkyard before in in sort of in, in settings and everything. And but for all of them and for future ones, I mean, is there a specific source you pull from in terms of how you come up with these ideas, or is it just not sort of like you're driving on the highway and you're like, oh, something crashed, you know, like onto that roof. Like that'd be a cool fight with those ducks and everything. You know, <laughs> that kind of leads into something I was curious about too. I was wondering if like comic books or anything actually mm. had an mm. impact on what you decide to make up. Oh yeah, uh, absolutely. But uh, so the way it basically works for a lot of these books is we make a big list of what we want. So for uh, for danger zones, what we did is I put together the example zone and I give the authors like a sample, an outline that's like, you know, make sure you've got these headings and mm -hmm. you've got this word count to work with. Mm -hmm. And then I've got a list of different areas in a city and to say, you know, pick two or five of these that you think are cool to write about and you have fun ideas for and send them out to them. Wow. Uh, so most of the great ideas in this series come from a really big circle of incredibly talented writers. That's awesome. Hmm. So uh, I, I mm -hmm. kind of picked the locations based on you know, what's around the cities that I've lived in mm -hmm. and what you see on TV shows or in movies or in comics. Mm -hmm. What places generally appeal to you? Like, like when you see, you're like, okay, yeah. Like, do you tend to like stay away from more like dark gothic areas? And you're like, you know, I just like more of these other brighter areas or vice versa, you know? I mean, me personally, yeah, um, I am basically a little goth dwarf. Yeah. So <laughs> I love overly elaborate like decoration and i like being underground that like musty smell of old concrete basements is really comforting to me mm -hmm. so <laughs> i tend to set things like underground or in basements yeah. or subterranean layers or caves things so like that so what you're saying is we're going to be seeing like a catacombs adventure. We are going to see sewers and subways, though. Okay. Yeah. Well, that works. I, could, I could use a subways one. I use those. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, for ours, so very good. close to <laughs> D&D style. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How, yeah, how yeah, long does that's... it generally take to, so uh, for one of these sort of ideas, um, like from conception to the actual uh, publish, uh, publication of it, how long does that generally take to put together? Uh, well, we have... We give writers about six weeks to to turn around. Uh, most of these are about twenty four hundred words. 
Okay. And, you know, then we, we get back what they've written. I read through it and give them some notes usually and send it back for some revisions. Yeah. And I get another two to three weeks for that. Uh, then when it comes back in, uh, I mean, depending on how big it is, it can take usually a day, maybe a day and a half to two days to, you know, go through and edit and develop the ideas, mm -hmm. make sure that it uses the, the really consistent language that we try to put in all our rule books. That's fair. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes there's an idea that they've come across that's really, really good, but isn't like fully developed to a point where GMs can use it. So we'll go in and okay. tweak that. Uh, and then usually that comes in with a map sketch that we turn over to a cartographer and the cartographer has anywhere from two weeks to two months to, you know, give us a map back. Mm -hmm. uh, we usually give them to them in a, a big pile of requests. So yeah, wow. It's like the checklist. Two months for one map isn't that huge. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah I see. Usually two months for like this stack of 10 maps. Uh -huh. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, man. So, uh, so, yeah, I mean, like overall, like birth to, to publication, uh, two to three months. Okay, that makes sense. That, yeah, that's kind of what I, yeah. I was thinking, you know. And that's, you know, at any given point, that's like two to eight to 16 hours of time invested from me at any given point. Mm -hmm. And then lots of time from our writers. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how long they take on their own. Like it's, it's usually, January. if it's a writer, it's a like cram time, right? Oh. So it's oh, like yeah. they have oh, two yeah. days left and boom, punch it out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You can always tell when that's what happens. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so just lots a, of adverbs find their way into the writing. <laughs> it's a Mad Lib. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, um, with all the different uh, things and systems and games that you have worked on, do work on, is, are there any games that you just play for fun, like like tabletop uh, campaigns <laughs> that you're in, like, without having to deal with work? Yeah, yeah, non work related. <laughs> non work related. <laughs> Trying, and that's <laughs> uh, I have a, I have two different fifth edition games going right now, and then just recently I got pulled into working on fifth edition. Yeah. So mm. it's, <laughs> it sounds like now it's a conflict relaxing. of interest. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it wasn't work, uh, but now it's work. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I really love you know the World of Darkness games. Yes. I was, mm. I was very much a a little uh, crypt kitty back in <laughs> the nineties when those were huge. Yeah. Um, so I played a lot of vampire and a lot of werewolf and a lot oh, of mage. Nice. Yep. Nice. Yeah, I'm playing mage right now and I can't stand it sometimes. But that's <laughs> it. I think well, it's, the thing about mage is it's the fine art of sweet talking your GM. A hundred percent. That's it. A hundred. And I, you know, my GM's so, in chat right now, so I can't say anything. <laughs> I, no, what you can say is that your GM is incredibly good looking and innovative. There you go. <laughs> Hear that? Hear that? <laughs> um, but yeah, I haven't had a chance to actually play any World of Darkness games in a couple of years at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, likewise, I used to play Shadowrun, but haven't oh, had the chance in years. I wish. We, we've oh, tried yeah. Shadowrun. We've tried. I know. It's, it's, it's such a different rule set to yeah. get used it, to. Yeah, it doesn't help we played with like nine people. Oh, yeah. Like That's eight true. Or nine that doesn't people, make so. learning the rules easy. <laughs> no. It's, I mean, there's a lot of dice rolling. Oh, so yeah. It can be a little slow. Are you uh, GMing anything right now? Oh, uh, yes, I'm GMing for a Let's Play podcast called Adventurous, where we play Pathfinder First Edition. Huh? Back when we started it, it was just playing Pathfinder. Yeah. <laughs> well, you were, you uh, worked on Pathfinder, too, as well, right? Oh, yeah. I ran the Pathfinder Adventure Path series yeah. for yeah. three years. But That's, oh, nice. Have you ever ran your, like, adventures for your players? Oh, yes. or, or was That's that too, like... Is. Huh? <laughs> Oh, adventurous is we're playing through a an adventure path called War for the Crown. It's a big political intrigue storyline. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, might as well go. I don't know if you had something to continue, but like, I wanted to ask something about like GMing in in general oh, yeah. from, from your perspective as well. Um, I mean, do you do you find yourself using a lot of the techniques you use for designing in your GMing, like to encourage players to do things or design? I mean. What have you learned from designing to help your GMing style? A lot of what I've learned from designing is figuring out 
like you can write as much of a script as you want, but we all know players will very rarely follow it. Oh yeah. So don't look at me like that. <laughs> <laughs> when do we ever follow so, the script? <laughs> what I figured out from designing is the important thing is to make sure game masters understand the where and the who and the why of the adventure mm -hmm. so that when people do go off the rails, they've got enough information that they can ad lib along the way. Okay. So you kind of need to know like where the adventure is taking place, what's going on, what valuable MacGuffin everybody's after, mm -hmm. like what the goals for people are. And then you need to know who is involved, like on the player's side, who's working against them and what their, their motivations are and what kind of, what kind of tools or, or resources they can throw at people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I do try to run, like, work in a, a loose script for everything I run as a GM, but yeah. ever since they started designing professionally, it's been much more important for me to be aware of of those big picture questions mm -hmm. and yeah. then kind it, of the rest fall. It must be a, a strange contrast between that sort of big question, you know, big, big picture and finer detail and, like, trying to balance the two, <laughs> especially, like, from bleeding into each other, you know? You obviously don't want to be too like like a dictator at the table or anything yeah. like that and it's, mm. i found a lot of like a lot of what helps you as a gm is paying attention to what your players get excited about mm. and then working whatever that is into what you already had planned for the adventure so mm -hmm. if they don't want to go talk to the mysterious person in the corner in the cloak who is supposed to give them their big adventure to go steal the key of eternity from uh. the vault of lost dreams. Write that down, write that down. <laughs> <laughs> and, and instead they're really into this like goblin barmaid that you just threw in like a random string of words. That's yeah. right. Well, yeah, that's you would right. be like, well, I used to be a normal raiding goblin, but then I stumbled across this weird like vault of lost dreams and when i came out i don't want to be evil anymore and i had to keep having dreams about this key it's all magnetic it all somehow gets yeah. back to to the uh, the plot yep. um, kind of... yeah the idea is just like take the things they bond to and mm. just hijack your plot onto that yeah. so then your players feel a lot more invested and mm. you don't have to completely rework everything from scratch right kind of uh similarly is it like a big was it because uh, Mutants and Masterminds is very like, oh, like ambiguous. You could do like almost anything in it. Uh, was it like difficult going from like a more structured like D and D where it's like you go X amount of spaces. I know what your abilities can do to like. All right, you you're literally doing something that breaks the game, and I don't know how to deal with this. <laughs> yeah. A little bit of a learning curve. Yeah. <laughs> I mean. I mean, like you said, you're going from a system where, I mean, you kind of have an idea the players are fifth level. So mm -hmm. you know that mm -hmm. means your wizard has access to fireball, your fighter has two attacks per round, yeah. so you basically doubled their damage output. Mm -hmm. Your rogue has this much sneak attack die. So you can kind of plan for those yeah. situations. Yeah. Whereas... In mutants and masterminds, maybe everybody can fly. Maybe nobody can fly. <laughs> yeah. Maybe everybody needs to breathe. Maybe nobody needs to breathe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It also works because like the the PowerPoint system is so um, it can be so strong. Where <clears throat> you know you you go from power level ten to eleven, and that's uh, what uh, fifteen thirty points uh, a difference, yeah. and like it takes like two points to fly. Yeah. yeah. You know, and mm -hmm. so yeah. instead of being like, ah, when when they hit, like you said, level five, they have the second attack, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's like, oh yeah, this person is suddenly god tier at like yeah. half the things they were mediocre at yeah. now because yeah. they yeah. the points. <laughs> That's so, so interesting. Yeah. When you create like uh, adventures and stuff for that, how do you, what do you do differently in like that situation that you would do in a, like a D and d setting? Like, how do you account oh. for that? I mean, a lot of it you can't quite account for. You can, part of it is we structure the adventures a little differently. You don't just build them as like a, a dungeon crawl yeah. where this map location has this item and this map location has this, has has three ghouls waiting mm -hmm. to eat brains. Mm -hmm. uh, you kind of have to structure it. What we do is we structure it in scenes, like big plot movements. Mm -hmm. So like 
the players have this happen and then like as a gm you try to move them to this place in the story and hope you can kind of keep them on track through all of it mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of it comes down to trusting the gm to to be able to play with their their players strengths mm -hmm. and weaknesses uh, each adventure has a little sidebar in it that talks about problem powers that might like unravel the whole thing like if yeah. you're running a mystery then somebody who can read minds is going to cause issues <laughs> uh, we know a yeah. lot about that we sure yeah. are <laughs> i don't know what you're talking about <laughs> we try to provide a little basic advice uh, we've got a supplement called power profiles that yes goes into yeah a lot of detail. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we're consulting Th that constantly thank, oh, yeah. thank you so much <laughs> power profiles i oh, love God. all of those so much that's john lighthouser the my my predecessor on the line who yeah. had a lot of great ideas it's That's it's awesome. it's so nice like for new and old players alike to have that reference yeah. As well. yeah. oh Absolutely. yeah i i, I kind of consider it like a core book alongside the the deluxe player's handbook yeah, yeah. because that absolutely that pro or that power design system is mm. so open and flexible that yeah well like i said you can do anything with it and it gets a little overwhelming oh yeah yeah it, it certainly is daunting for for newer people mm -hmm. certainly but once yeah, you once you get the it's practically doing algebra for fun <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But once you get the nuances of it it's fun. Fun. yeah yeah jeez. <laughs> oh, yeah and but once you get it and then you start to realize you can do things you just could not do in other tabletop mm -hmm. games which yeah. is so nice or oh, yeah. you can but it's way more difficult oh, yeah. you know it, it's daunting for new I mean, players to even that, oh. But it's... oh sorry <laughs> no 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 <laughs> Uh, I was just gonna say it's, it's a, a lot of. Oh. <laughs> well, one, two, three. No, go. <laughs> Jinxie, you after, go. After you, after yes, the guests. Yeah, yeah, yes. Oh, I was, I was gonna say a lot of the innovations from Mutants and Masterminds are actually inherited from older superhero RPGs that have mm, tried to yeah. solve these problems. Mm -hmm. So some yeah. of it's pulled from uh, Silver Age Sentinels. You'll find a lot of elements lifted from uh, the old DC Heroes game yes. from the yeah, yeah, yeah. Marvel Phase that, Rift System from TSR. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I was just gonna say, um, <laughs> even for for newer tabletop players, even jumping into a game like D and D where it's more structured, but you can do anything in the world is very daunting. But in this game, where you can do anything in the world and anything with your character is much more daunting. Oh, you know? yeah. Like, talking about the power profiles and everything. Like, that's those. it's so helpful even just to see, like, you can have, like, flame powers or time powers or the... It just it structures it just a little bit to give you an idea of, like, maybe I can do this. Yeah, you know? and, you know, that, that also goes into, like, the danger zones themselves mm. are such a big help on the GM side because you have these players that can do everything and you want to make locations that can help, but sometimes that might feel a bit overwhelming. You, kinda, you mm. need that, that nice guide to help you... Uh, get on the right track and uh, you know when you have characters who can fly or run at 4,000 miles an hour <laughs> yeah. or like teleport or something like that having those ideas those danger zones are so helpful <laughs> to just look so at what I'm here mm. Gonna say what I'm hearing is we need to put out Danger Zones, Florida. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Please. I'm pretty sure that's what it is right now. Yeah, yeah. Florida. Yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. oh my god. <laughs> I grew up there. It's always been a danger zone. <laughs> well, well, Florida, I Florida we, holds a special place for everyone. Yeah. I think we depicted it accurately. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they came across a, like a otherworldly hellscape in our campaign, and the first thing they called it was Florida. Florida. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So now hell in our campaign is officially Florida. Yeah. yeah. We refer to it in character as Florida all the time, and it must be so weird for newer viewers because they think we're talking about real Florida. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we get there, and the moon is an eyeball, and the sky is red, and you know, Florida. Yeah, yeah. Florida. Florida. <laughs> you know. Knew you'd oh understand. <laughs> um. So out of, I mean, you've obviously done like a ton of projects, both like with mutants and masterminds and D and D. Which one is like your absolute like? I know you said you like the under like uh, underground type, but what's the absolute favorite thing you've ever like published that you were just like, yes, uh -huh. this is great. Um, <laughs> choose your child. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're asking me to choose which child is my yep, favorite. Yep, yeah. No matter what I mm -hmm. pick. The others will will cry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Maybe right now. <laughs> Your favorite for uh, now. At, at this moment. I'm really proud of War for the Crown. It was a six-part adventure series that I developed for Pathfinder, mm -hmm. and it's a lot of the players take on the role of spies, trying mm. to like, yeah. stop a secession crisis in a monarchy. 
And so you're you're going around like not just trying to be a spy, but also kind of trying to help fix this kingdom that mm. the last super corrupt king completely botched. So, Big oof. <laughs> yeah. Oops. <laughs> It's a lot of fun, and I got to take this part of our world that had always just been kind of a joke, not something you actually use in your campaign, and I gave it a history and a culture and like, characters. Mm -hmm. And so I'm I'm pretty proud of like not just the work I did on that, but like all the amazing people I got to work with to make it real. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. A lot of the best projects come down to who you got to work with along the way. Yeah. And um, before you got into the uh, the tabletop industry, what what uh what inspired you to to do this kind of work? What inspired you to, to get into the field? Uh, <laughs> took my question. This <laughs> work. You're not gonna believe this, but before I was a professional tabletop industry writer, mm -hmm. I was a gamer. Mm, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. Sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's a stretch. I, I know girl and gamer. Oh god. <laughs> Uh, no, I was a big tabletop gamer in high school, mm -hmm. and I actually ran a blog on the wee baby internet back in today. <laughs> <laughs> um, back in redacted. <laughs> and so I ended up, you know, submitting some of my gaming blogs to different magazines and oh got published, and that led to like my first round of being a freelancer in the industry some time ago, mm -hmm. and. <laughs> I had some bad experiences early on and sort of left to just go do other things mm -hmm. with my life. Yeah. And eventually came back to came back to the industry accidentally when I wanted to get into self-publishing and ran into Sarah Robinson, uh Paizo's art director, randomly one day. Mm -hmm. And was like, As you oh, do. you're yeah. the art director on Pathfinder, I would love to learn InDesign. Can I come intern with you for a couple of weeks and you'll teach me like the basics of graphic design? Yeah. And so wow. she brought me on board oh, wow. as an intern and then there was so much work that needed to be done. They brought me on as an art assistant oh, wow. and that turned into me working in the art department for a while. And then they discovered I'd written a whole bunch of RPG articles and adventures like 10 years earlier. Huh. <laughs> Oh, and they yes. started. They started hiring me to write more things. Wow! Oh, wow. wow. That's awesome. That's yeah. <laughs> that, that was a good opportunity to have yeah. right there. To yeah. The and just I I was ready to. I I still gamed, but I was ready to not be a game developer or game writer anymore, and mm. just kind of came into it sideways. Oh, nice! Wow. My, my wife is actually the one who encouraged me to take the uh, the the internship with Paizo. Oh, really? That's awesome. That's, yeah. <laughs> Good call. No, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good advice. <laughs> oh. oh, wow. Good. Oh, I'm good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, with, uh, I know you also worked on, this is, when, when I was doing, like, research, I was like, okay, hold on, I have to ask a little bit about this, because um, you did something for Critical Role. Oh. Mm -hmm. Onto there, oh. it says on your wiki. I don't know if that you, I think you did some artwork for them or something, right? Or Oh, no, the you're thinking of the critical role campaign setting. Yeah, yes, uh, the Exandria one, right? I believe. Uh yes. yes. Uh Green Ronin produced that a couple of years ago, uh just before I or no, I guess it was as I was joining the company. Oh, okay. I had no idea what critical role was at the yeah, time. Yeah. <laughs> I had no idea what they were working on and they basically like dropped me into the lap of mutants and master lines and were like, swim! <laughs> so I was completely uninvolved in the critical role project. Okay. I didn't really know what it was or who Matt Mercer was until he was in our booth at Gen Con signing things. Oh, That's wow. awesome. And then I was like, who is this smug bastard? <laughs> Come out of here. <laughs> yeah, that sounds about right. That's amazing. <laughs> what, uh, what sort of uh advice would you give to someone trying to get into the industry mm. i mean that's something everybody's looking for oh, in yeah. terms of like especially just, now because yeah. it's getting so big I mean, and mm. yeah the industry has gotten huge in the last probably just five years inflated, yeah like um, crazy oh. yeah just i mean this answer changes every time We've yeah, got, sure like so many new technology oh yeah 
options that we just didn't have when I got in. Mm -hmm. And so much of getting into the industry is accident or luck or chance that like the way that works for me might not work for anyone else. It right. feels like everyone I know has a different story. But mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of it comes down to like practice your writing, mm -hmm. you know, make your writing available. So start a, a blog or a Patreon mm. or something yeah. like that. So that you can, if, if you do run into a game designer you like and you ask them, you can always be like, and here's a sample of my yeah. work. Here's my portfolio. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and a lot of it just comes down to, you know, going to conventions or getting involved mm. in discord communities mm -hmm. or otherwise, you know, being involved in the community and not being a dick. Ah, <laughs> oh, well, damn, yeah. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> getting to know people. Yeah. I mean, build a build a little community with other developers that you're are other like writers who want to get started, mm -hmm. and you can help critique and edit each other's work and talk mm -hmm. each other up. And uh, when one of you gets a writing gig, you can always you know prop that door open and sure. tell your editor, "Well, I've got these friends mm -hmm. yeah. who you know help with help develop all of my genius. You might like them." Mm -hmm. With with your experience in in this this field, what do you think at the moment? is sort of the most um most wanted or most uh sought after what, yeah sought after pos like individuals that you are looking for like i mean I, I imagine there are a lot of writers out there trying you know fighting their way to get to where they need to be but is there any other positions that like you're just like yeah i wish there were more of those you know uh, occupations out there yeah like you said everybody wants to be a writer it's mm -hmm. it's like on tv everybody wants to be a writer or be an actor but there's mm. tons of positions mm. in the industry we need mm. more of uh good cartographers are worth their weight in gold mm. uh, illustrators uh graphic designers are so underappreciated because they can really take a confusing topic and make it so approachable mm -hmm. uh editors are hands down the most valuable people in the industry and do not get enough credit that's interesting uh, huh. I, I wouldn't because, chalk it up to yeah. the editor <laughs> Creative types mm -hmm. tend to not be very good spellers. <laughs> like every writer I know, like their prose comes out so eloquent and flowery, and then we text each other, and it's like, "Are you yeah. okay today? Yo, yeah. How are you? <laughs> yeah. How you? Yeah." yeah. I'm absolutely <laughs> guilty of that. <laughs> I, I like go to type stuff, and it, it's like when you see a word, and you're like, that can't be how it's spelled. <laughs> yeah. uh, another fun secret is just about every writer in the industry is dyslexic or has some other basic learning disability. So <laughs> editors are so valuable to us, yeah. and they don't get enough love or credit. Uh, likewise, developers are... I mean, it's kind of a thankless job that everybody thinks is glamorous, but it's actually just kind of being a glorified editor who also tries to teach people. Yeah. 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 Um, and, I mean, if there is any anything in this industry that deserves a lot of credit, it's, uh, like, anybody who works in ops. So people who work with the shipping companies to mm. get your product out on time, uh, who work directly with your customers to keep them happy and to keep them informed. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so all of your customer service folk, all of your warehousing and shipping people, uh, like... Or even now, I guess, social people. media, too. Oh, yeah, your social media person, your community managers. Oh, yeah. It's... I mean, the industry has a lot of moving parts, mm. and and like writers and developers are just a small part of it. Yeah, and it seems as though, like like in your position that you were in previously, you know, uh, it, it's it's open. So like you can go in as a sort of graphic designer and end up becoming a writer instead, you know, or like dipping your toes in all of that work. So it doesn't seem very rigid. <laughs> well, I mean, it's. It's a matter of what you study, and I just come out of art school, and mm -hmm. I had the history of being a writer, so right. it just yeah. lined up weirdly well. Meshed well, yeah. 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 And um, so I guess I just kiss a lot of frogs and see what works for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a way to put it. Yeah. And which role do you think that do you, like? Do you think the role that you're in right now is just like 
exactly like where you want to be or do you have like like bigger picture mm. like you want to one day like maybe start your own thing or make a i know you already did um adventures and stuff but anything bigger than that i mean i guess i'd like to do my own company someday but i'm not like i don't have that big organizational mind mm. like the, the ops people i was talking about like yeah i don't have the brain to make like the business side of things work so mm -hmm. i'm kind of okay working for other people yeah i don't know that i'm gonna be a, a developer forever because writing is the really fun part of the yeah. job and so what a lot of people in the industry do is kind of cycle between two or three positions they really love to do yeah. until they burn out on one and go to the other yeah the so. the the industry itself i mean is I'm, did i interrupt you i don't know i don't know oh no okay, i'm just kind of gonna some things up no worries oh sorry um the the industry itself like you said it's gotten really popular in the past five six you know uh, years over there uh with the way trends are at the moment or anything does does it concern you at all that it's just gonna like pop like it, it, do you have any worries about how this is you know what do you think of this boom of of, of tabletop gaming well i think I think this boom is due to a couple of major factors. Mm -hmm. Like there's there's the critical role factor. Mm -hmm. You took you took a, a pretty approachable game, which is fifth edition D D, and you gave it to very popular, very charismatic, very pretty people and had and said, Go ahead and have a ton of fun with this and then you made it available for lots of people to consume. Mm -hmm. So that's like a a big bump in terms of like the old reputation for Dungeons and Dragons was that it was just for single dateless nerds yeah. to do on a Friday night. Mm. I know because <laughs> we're all just like, ha ha ha. We play Wednesdays. <laughs> So I was watching a sitcom where a woman is horrified to discover this guy she likes plays D and D, and they showed him at his D and D group wearing like a pointed wizard yeah, hat. That's yeah. always the stereotype. Yeah, it's it's really always the is. fake beard and the wizard yeah. hat. I kind of want that. I want that really bad. You want the Robin wizard hat? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh my god, we should start cosplaying yeah. our characters. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> You've got handsome voice actors and Vin Diesel, and oh, yeah. like Vin Diesel made a giant triple A oh, movie that's about true. his D&D character. Yeah, yeah. that's right. <laughs> yep. So, I mean, we've shed a lot of the old stigma mm. that, that was there, and it's kind of becoming cool. And at the same time, we're seeing this big boom in small press publishing online and like micro RPGs that fit mm. every kind of niche or interest. So it's it's a combination of a, an image overhaul and availability, and I don't know that it's going to be super popular forever, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's going to pop pop. Mm -hmm. Like, I think we'll see, like, a slow kind of decline, but I think it's going to stay something that's a lot more popular with people. Yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely, I think also, I, with COVID happening, mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of people have been able to be like, oh, what do we do? Ah, like, oh, there's... Uh, you know, April 20, you know, I can yeah. go on to there yeah. and get my friends together and yeah. play. That's been, yeah. you know. I can just, yeah. I can just get a couple of friends together on Discord. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah Discord. Yeah. And, you know, thank Discord. <laughs> yeah, with, with everything going on, I feel like, um, you know, obviously being in person is a big part of tabletop games, but even with everything that's going on, it hasn't really seen a decline from COVID just because of that. But yeah, just mm -hmm. put yeah. A, make a map on Roll20, get on Discord and have fun. Mm. Yeah, I know. Cool. I know the people at Roll Twenty got slammed when the lockdown oh, started. I bet. Oh, oh my not gosh! Expecting, like that kind of influx. Yeah, that's yeah imagine. buy more servers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really, that's rough. I know that's crazy. Jeez. But um, yeah, I, I, you know, I just think that's it's valuable information coming from an individual who's been in the, the industry and is you know you seem deep rooted into it now. I mean, you're you're kind of in it for the long shot now. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I don't think I'm actually... I don't think there's an escape route for me. <laughs> you're, you're, you're nice kids, get out of here before it's too late. <laughs> oh my Rip God. the green street. 
It's a sham. No, don't open the door. Just go through it. We're going to become accountants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a lot to be said for stability and, and financial security and then just doing your hobby as a thing you love. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Instead of a thing you get paid for. Yeah. Did you, um, I don't know if I misheard or not before, did you say you, you stream one of your games? Uh, you had a play uh, podcast? Uh, uh, yes, uh, I stream with the the No Direction Podcast Network. Okay. Uh, and stream. Uh, it's a Pathfinder First Edition campaign. Yep. We call the series Adventurous. Now, and that, is that the first time you've you've like broadcasted a game uh, like yourself with yourself, Gianni? Or have you done it before? Almost. I've I've broadcast individual games like sure. one off. Sure, like, sure. Like, charity streams and things like that. Well, uh, how do you how do you feel about that experience of of uh, the difference between you know obviously there's the obvious differences like you know watch your language like something like that you know what I mean and something and, we don't yeah, kind of, yeah <laughs> like conduct uh, and whatnot but uh, how have you felt has been that difference in GMing uh, uh, for people I definitely feel more pressure to be on mm. like mm. to to play up the NPC accents and mannerisms and and to try and keep things going so instead of like saying a roll like a roll a check for this i'll have i'll just ask like what's your take 10 on it and just like decide or not so we don't lose the momentum of stop roll a die read the die do the math in your head sure. yeah that yeah. sounds like uh, we were talking about that a couple of weeks ago it's almost like you're putting on a show as well as playing the game yeah it's I mean, it's probably a little easier for me because I was a drama geek back in high school, Fair. a little bit in college, so I'm kind of used to, like, stepping into a role, and now we're on stage, and I'm projecting from my diaphragm! Projecting! Yeah. Also how I get through cons. <laughs> yeah. Soon I have a lot of social anxiety. Somehow the medium's going to advance to where now you have to dance to, like, yeah. show, like, I don't know how, don't ask me how, I'm not an innovator, I can't, don't make that oh, game, I, please. My <laughs> players stumbled across Faye a couple weeks ago, so I had to come up with little rhymes on the fly. Oh, oh man. <laughs> probably what's very, very offensive. <laughs> oh, God. But, um, I like to say I'm a quarter Irish, so maybe that counts. <laughs> Put that in a resume or something. Yeah. <laughs> Good at Irish, limericks. So I can do an accent. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh gosh. Uh, so, uh, how long have you guys been playing uh, online for for that? Oh gosh. Um, I can think it's about a year and a half at this point. Oh wow! Wow, a year oh, nice. and a half. Wow. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. We Did... used to do like big marathon recording sessions of about six hours at a time. Oh wow. We've... We did everything going on with COVID. We kind of had to start breaking them up. Like mm. we'll record one or two hours every other week. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know that's that's interesting because we. When never we would play otherwise, we'd play for like five oh, plus yeah. hours. Yeah, you know before what I mean? we start yeah. recording. Yeah, definitely yeah. when you start recording, it's, it's we only do it for what, three, three and a half hours? Usually we cap it out around three. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, you can't just come and go like you can at the North Table. Yeah, normally. yeah. You can eat at the table. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, you, you can't order the pizza during, <laughs> yeah. the, yeah. during the session, have a come can't, like, You can't, like, oh, I got a phone call, I'll be back in yeah, five minutes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's that's our problem. We you just hear like whoosh, whoosh, like into the yeah. mic as you're like chewing on something. Yeah. You're like sorry. Yeah, and is it even D and D without the uh, the nachos? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not. It's a different oh, experience. I got in trouble at the theater for eating nachos when I was a little kid. <laughs> I don't know. Oh. That just brought us some deep seated memories. <laughs> oh no! Now we can't do, talk do about nachos anymore. <laughs> no, I don't want to talk yeah. about. It. <laughs> well, I mean, the problem wasn't the nachos. It's that you were like screaming, "F yeah, nachos!" nachos. <laughs> oh, this is perfect, great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The usher's coming around like, "Ma'am, could you control your four year old?" <laughs> He's throwing nachos and booing the movie. <laughs> Four years old. I was like 20. No. Yeah. She's like, is that toddler drunk? Uh, hold on, let me just go. go um, I'm organizing my thoughts. So, <laughs> so you obviously have uh, made a lot of things. Do you prefer playing or do you, like, do you just like love GMing? I, I mean, I like both, but I mean... 
Given the choice, I really love GMing. I kind of like building the world. I like jumping between a few different characters. And I love watching the players, like, kind of that moment where they step into the game and they're, like, invested and doing things based on their characters and putting things together the way their character would. Yeah. And it's... Ah, oh, it, I love that moment. Yeah, it's so satisfying. It's very cathartic. It's very just like, ah, yes, everybody is on the same page and mm -hmm. in sync. And, you know, there's not a lot of uh, other activities that can really get that out of people. Mm. That's why tabletop yeah. is so awesome. But uh, with how many, you know, games that are out right now and that you've worked on, uh, are there any games that you haven't seen yet that you want to? Like a, like a certain t kind of game. Are you about to pitch your space bagel? Idea? Oh, you know what I was thinking about it. <laughs> Listen, what? I almost say food trucks in space. <laughs> Why? That's it. That's it. Terrible. Terrible. No way. Lunar bagel, best game. It sounds like you just want to start a business. Elon Musk, I'm calling you. Elon Musk. Oh my god. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the concept that I would love to see that I haven't really seen yet is like a. An asymmetrical, like a reverse asymmetrical RPG, where okay. like normally the GM has all the powers and the players are, you know, running through whatever. I want to see a game where you've got like three or four GMs who have a little bit of power each mm. and one player who has like, who is basically the protagonist of the story. Huh. Mm, that'd be really interesting. Yeah, that'd be, be like really a cool. gauntlet style kind yeah. of like, oh, that'd be, hmm. That could yeah. be really or it cool. Could be like, yeah, yeah, basically, basically like a almost like a an old side scroller where mm. or a sh like a shoot 'em up or, or something, something like that where you've got like one core character central to the story, and, and then each GM has some control or influence over how the plot and the opponents go. Mm. It sounds like group bullying. <laughs> <laughs> What is GM? Now, I feel pretty bullied it's, every week. Just, you feel so bullied? Do we. What do you, mean? you guys you bully me 24-7. There was a big debate on social media a couple years ago about like how it isn't like ethical to have a game master and give that one person in your friend's group all that power. Mm. It never really went anywhere, but it did lead to a, like, a nice surge in GM-less games and some playing around with that idea, so it was interesting. Yeah, there. I definitely see a lot more games now where it's it's way more group-centric. Oh, yeah. yeah. like we played Kids on Bikes the other oh, week, right, which yeah. like the creation of that was really... Um, like everybody, like it felt like we were all making that world, and then the GM yeah. just makes a story in that world. Yeah, yeah, really yeah. The, the uh, GM kind of felt more like keeping us on track as yeah. opposed to like we were playing in his world. It was yeah. like we had all the creative, like, what, like building, like we created the town and how we wanted it to go, and he just like facilitated mm. where it was gonna go and when. But mm. we like pretty much made the stepping stones to that, which I liked a lot. Yeah. There's been a, there has been a lot more games. Even when I was looking at a um, drive through RPG, I was just going through games, and I saw a lot of GMless uh, tabletop games, and I was surprised. But a lot of them sounded cool. So we're we're in that yeah. middle ground. The G we have like regular GM middle, and now we need that asymmetrical. Yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. yeah like mm -hmm. Reverse GM. Reverse yeah, GM. Yeah, reverse GM. That's when your GM says this happens, and you're like, no, nope. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's just regular. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing ever goes right. <laughs> not supposed to um here i think well, we're pretty much coming to a close uh over here reaching that hour and a half mark uh, onto here um mm -hmm. anybody have any closing questions at all i feel like when i came into this interview i had so many questions and then as soon as we started i was like <laughs> nope that's <they're> all gone <laughs> that's the camera. Yeah. 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 on the spot it's all gone <laughs> I was um, like, oh, shit. Yeah, so, uh, Crystal, is there anything uh, right now, Green Ronin, uh, like newer projects, anything you want to sort of drop at the moment now you guys are working on or coming up? Yeah, yeah, basically <laughs> plug. Uh, well, we are we're working on new Astonishing Adventures every month. We're about to wrap up Nether War in about three weeks here. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the big, like, five sort of six-part adventure series mm. we've been doing for half the year and that's that's about to come to a close and we're about to move back and do a couple of one-shots before we get into the next adventure arc mm. 
Um, and then we've got danger zones coming out, and that's eventually going to be collected into a book with extra zones and more stat blocks and things like that for, oh, that's awesome. for everybody like a, to reference easily. Like a volume of like everything collected and... Oh, that's really useful. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah. Um, yep. we, now that we see that people like the idea and are buying it, we're like, oh, we'll put some more of these together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, what about any personal projects, anything that you, you're you on, working on, that you want to plug right now? Uh, <laughs> I've, I've got a couple of really cool writing projects, but none of them have been officially announced. I gotcha. So I, uh, her. If you would come to me like two, maybe three weeks later. <laughs> well, well, where would you be announcing these, these projects? Oh, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll be, be announcing, announcing them <laughs> all over my Twitter, <laughs> at Amazon Chic, C-H-I-Q-U-E. Uh, and, and, and believe me, you're going to get sick of hearing about them. <laughs> <laughs> not, not shut up once they're announced. <laughs> That's proper marketing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, there's, there's one that has been in, in process for like a year and a half now, oh, wow. and it's Ooh. just... Oh, I just want to talk about That's it so much. <laughs> Holding in a breath it's and like, like you oh, just can't yeah. exhale. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's like having a vestigial twin. And, and you gotta go through all of high school not telling anybody because they'll all freak out. <laughs> and then you find a vestigial twin support group and you're like, I'm never gonna shut up about it now. Oh my gosh. It's coming. It's, it's close. You're so close. <laughs> you're so close. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Just, just another... Hopefully two, maybe three weeks before I can start talking about some of these. <laughs> well, uh, make sure you keep an eye out for that. Mm -hmm. uh, Crystal, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, it yeah, been... thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, it's an absolute pleasure. Uh, and, you know, uh, thank Troy for me. I'll send an email too, but <laughs> thank him for oh, no. the Troy gets no credit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Troy. <laughs> but thank you so much. Back for in your Troy job. hole. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> it's Crystal time. Let's go. <laughs> 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 but uh, for everybody listening on YouTube, Spotify, this is where we're cutting off. So uh, thank you so much. And Crystal, thank you again. Yeah, thank you yeah, so much. Thank you so much for having me on. I right. really appreciate it. And again, I'm so sorry for leaving you all hanging last week. You've been just amazing people. It happens. No problem yeah. at all. Thanks for being with us now. That's what matters. Mm -hmm. All right. mm -hmm. And uh, we'll see you all next week. We're so gonna raid. One, I was gonna say, what's our plan for next week? Oh, uh, for next week, uh, maybe uh, season two. Mm -hmm. uh, no, 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 how dare you? Don't, don't, how dare you? Don't promise things. How dare you? Yeah. I was asking. I said that with like a question mark. <laughs> <laughs> maybe mystery science theater we'll type. Yeah, we'll we're, we're, it's in the works. Season two coming soon. Yeah, uh, but uh, we're gonna go raid. Yeah, we're gonna keep pushing for old RPGs from the nineties. Yeah, yeah. 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 Cool. Cool. you just flip through and make fun of them. <laughs> oh, we can do that. <laughs> in, in a in a wizard coat and a hat. Yes. Oh yeah, you're right. Yeah, I need the pointy hat. Yeah, I'll bring a fake oh, beard. It'll be a good time. That episode and send you a, like a YouTube link or something, and you could just heckle that. <laughs> All right, we're gonna go raid somebody on Twitch over yes. there. Everybody else. Uh, we love you. See you next week. Yeah, yeah see, you. see you next week. All right. All right. Have a great week.